Okay. Well, I have that it's six o'clock, so I think we can go ahead and get started. And I would like to welcome everyone to the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association educational webinar series. And tonight is actually the last in our free February series. So we wanted to do something different and uh, present to you uh, really the latest in uh, research trends and outlook for 2021. So I am just so excited to have Martha Sullins here and uh, presenting on the marketing for the new normalcy. So tonight's presentation will go over uh, research trends and um, things that uh, the researchers like Martha are learning. Martha Sullins is a front range regional specialist in food systems and business management at the Colorado State University. And here to present to you tonight on marketing for the new normalcy. Thank you so much for being here, Martha. Sure thing. Um, well, great. And I'm just glad to see folks on the um, on the screen here and my colleague Cole, who missed my dissing the wind <laughs> that, that I get to benefit from. But did, um, Kathleen, did you want to give me like co-host power there so I can um, Y'all don't want to hear me just talk through this, so it'll help to see some pictures. Yes. Yep. Aha. Okay, great. All right, so um, I'm going to go through um, of a fair amount of material. And so this is, you know, something everybody's been asking about is, you know, what can we expect looking to um, 2021, which we're in now? Um, you know, what are, what are some of the things that we can expect as we look at our, our different market channels? And so, um, yeah, as Kathleen said, you know, I'm gonna talk about some, you know, trends that we're seeing nationally, um, and as well as specific to different market channels, including local food production. And then Kathleen had also asked me to talk a bit about pricing and promotion. So we'll see how much we can squeeze in the hour. And if it gets to be too much, you know, we can um, possibly just answer questions, um, you know, at, a, at offline or something. But so what I wanted to talk about tonight was, you know, we've seen a lot of shifts in how people are buying general consumer goods as well as food, you know, since the COVID pandemic struck us all. And so, you know, then we have to ask ourselves, what, what do we expect as we look into 2021? Is it going to be more of the same? You know, is it, what are, what are, what's consumer behavior going to be like? And, and for you all, you know, how can you identify those trends and, you know, potential outcomes and, and what it's going to mean for your market channels. And then, as I said, you know, I hope to be able to talk a little bit about pricing and, and promotional strategies and give you a couple of examples of what we've been doing here in Colorado. So, you know, the first thing is just to identify, we'll talk about, you know, two buckets of market channels. And so um, one is those direct to consumer markets, and then the other is intermediated markets. And so, you know, direct to consumer is exactly that, directly to that end buyer. And so, you know, farm stands and farm stores, farmers markets, anybody who, you know, comes to your place to purchase um, farm products directly could be through a CSA. Um, but those, and then those intermediated markets are, you know, not directly to the end buyer, but there's another node in that supply chain. And so, um, and that's of course where we've seen some, some bumps during COVID, our retail food establishments, distributors, wholesalers, farm to school, farm to hospital, you know, those 
have been um, market channels where we've definitely seen a lot of disruption. And so, of course, as we're thinking about, you know, how we assess our existing channels and how we look forward, you know, each channel has its different, you know, cost benefit structure. And so, you know, we, I like this graphic because it, it helps us think in terms of, you know, the, the um, market that you're in, if you look up at the, at the top there and you can see, you know, you've got direct marketing in the red box, you've got intermediated marketing in that green box, and then commodity marketing there at the, the bottom of the screen. And so just thinking, you know, you have a lot more control over pricing and differentiation, and you're retaining certainly a larger share of that um, marketing dollar as a, as a direct to consumer, in a direct to consumer market, you've got a lot more pricing power compared to looking at um, those intermediated and commodity markets. But, you know, what I want to talk to you all about today, we're going to circle back to this, is that you really need some tools to evaluate, like, where on that continuum is a good place for you to be. And so I'm going to share, as Kathleen said, some research that we did at CSU that hopefully you guys will get excited about. We really enjoyed working with our um, specialty crop producers about it. Um, so the first thing is, you know, let's just step back and see what's been going on. And, you know, this is a, a national, international research group. And, you know, they identified four big trends. And then I put another that was in one of their top 10 trends that I think is important, but, you know, this, this shift to, um, you know, value and not spending as much on those discretionary purchases, but really, you know, spending more on essentials. Um, the second one, you know, is using digital online purchasing. And so definitely a large increase as we probably all have, have shifted our purchasing a lot to online. Um, and then, you know, I think number three is interesting, you know, 76% of consumers have changed stores, brands, or the way they shop. And so this is overall across consumer goods. But I just want to show you, there are some trends that really um, we see carrying from all consumer goods through to the food too. And so that's kind of going to be our, our takeaway. And then, of course, we've got um, people who are still at home more than they they would be. And so, you know, 64% of consumers are still either at home more, they're cooking at home. And so their purchases are really oriented towards things that they can do at home. And then the, the last one that I put in the little box at the bottom that I think is, is an important one is this whole issue of hygiene transparency. And I know, you know, for us in Colorado, it sounds like a weird term, but it was a really important issue, you know, that consumers knew you were being mindful of the fact that they may have, um, you know, compromised health, compromised immune system, they may have, um, you know, just concerns about their health. And so they want to know that you're taking that seriously, no matter what that point of sale is. And so, you know, the point is, they're seeing this um, also in, across uh, other consumers besides just uh, food buyers. So again, you know, back to the same um, source of information, you know, three out of four people have tried a new shopping method. Well, you know, those new methods, some of those really revolve around less contact. And so they may be, you know, real limited contact um, transaction there with a curbside pickup or a delivery service. And so I, I would be interested to hear from you all if you have tried something like that or have, you know, gone down that path, because certainly our producers in Colorado have found that that is a, it is a need to have that, you know, contactless type of transaction. And then again, across um, consumer goods, you know, nearly 70% of consumers um, who were surveyed through McKinsey said they intend to continue buying online to pick up in store. So, you know, how does that, you know, if we look at this and um, think about what that means for food, um, oh, this was the last one I wanted to share with you. This is interesting because this is basically um, by week 
and, and we miss a couple of weeks in here, but um, this is a different uh, survey company, but what this graph shows you is the um, share of individuals who are purchasing online when they would normally go into a store. And I think what's so interesting about this is, you know, you look at that far left, March the 10th, kind of beginning of the, the pandemic when it really started to impact us, and we had a small share of people doing that. Well, we get over to, you know, July when people could be out and about, and we're seeing still, you know, 43, 50% of individuals still shopping online come all the way to the far right hand side of this graphic, January 25th, and we've got 39%. So we're seeing this, you know, persistence of behavior. Now, granted, we don't know, you know, once we get on the other side of this, what it's going to look like, but this is showing us that some behaviors are persisting and, you know, even during times when people might feel more comfortable being out and about making their purchases. So this data then really refers to um, local food purchases. And so this is a national survey that um, a set of colleagues did and what they did is they looked at, um, you know, among 5,000 consumers, you know, what were some of the, the factors that were influencing where they were buying food, you know, and, and how they were buying it. And, and a big thing that this research came away with is there was just a lot of um, economic disruptions, so people being laid off, um, you know, losing jobs permanently, decreased income. And so, you know, a lot of disruption meant too, that, you know, people were changing um, what they were purchasing. And of course, they were purchasing more at home. Most of us were eating out very much. And then they were shifting the locations of where they made those purchases. So one thing that um, these researchers found is that, you know, these small artisan markets, and then of course, dollar stores became a lot more popular. And they were probably some of the um, the locales that actually had consumer goods to purchase. So, um, and then the other thing that they found was this shift that, you know, 10 to 20% of this 5,000 person survey, um, 20, you know, between 10 to 20% of those consumers were shopping local. And so we'll look at this in a little bit more detail, but you can go and download, there are three, fact sheets there at local food economics. I put the link in there. And um, there's a lot of other information that I think is really good for producers too, that you can find information on, for example, um, you know, what are some of the, the um, aspects of different online platforms that might work well for you if you're looking at doing sales online. So there's a lot of really good resources there. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, so this same data then looked at, so, you know, people started shopping in these local markets. And if you look at this graph, it shows, you, you know, they, look, they um, identified farmers markets, CSAs, and other kinds of direct uh, from producer type of arrangements, food boxes, um, artisan market, local independent restaurants. So, you know, this, what this graph shows is that um, be, you know, these are the consumers who were still shopping in a local market channel in September 2020. So they started at the beginning of the pandemic, like once they got this survey out in the field, and, you know, there was still a good 20 some percent who were shopping in local markets. And so there's this persistence again that we're seeing that I think is you know, something to, to keep in mind. And then the, the last thing here is looking at, um, you know, the growth in online shopping. And so this, this graphic shows you from September 2019, and this is that, that same group of consumers to September 2020, you know, you can see that you've got this, you know, still significant and persistent um, staying power of people in these um, shopping channels, you know, they're, they're still online. And that's, you know, that's kind of interesting, too, that, again, we're seeing um, this, this persist over time. 
So, you know, there are some new opportunities. I think, you know, those opportunities, there, there are some risks there because some of these um, platforms, some of these outlets are maybe unknown. And so, you know, what I wanted to, to share with you all is a tool that we used um, that I think will, um, you know, show you one way to evaluate the profitability of, of different market channels. And so as a, a run up to that, I wanted to show you why we focused on labor primarily as an as a as an important indicator of profitability. And so this is some research that colleagues of mine did a couple of years ago. And so what they did, this is a, a national data set, but they looked at um, different variable expenses across different size operations. So you've got gross cash farm income, as you see, you know, 1,000 to 74,999. You know, each of those sets of bars represents a net gross farm cash farm income bracket. And so what they did is they said, well, you know, where, what are, what do share expenditure shares look like across those different brackets? And you can see that green bar is labor as a, um, a variable expense. And you can see all the way over to $1 million and higher, you know, labor is approaching 35% of variable expenses. So labor is an important expenditure. Um, and this is just the, the last graph in this vein, but this shows you again, those, those same um, cash farm income brackets, but this is also looking at profitability. So I know there's a lot going on here, but these quartiles refer to the pink there on the far left are the, you know, the lowest performing quartiles in terms of, um, return on assets. And then, oops, I think I have to admit somebody here. Um, and then going all the way up to green, that yellow, that orange to the, you know, quartile four is uh, the best performing. And so you can see if you look at profitability within each of those gross cash farm income brackets, those um, labor is still an important share of variable costs. So there's a reason for telling you this. I wanted to share that with you to say, you know, we said, well, you know, given all this information, how do we look at um, the profitability across market channels? And so we drew on um, some work that Cornell had done. And so they looked at, you know, not just, you can see, you know, they not just pricing in a market channel and profitability, the cost structure, the volume of product that you could move through it, labor. But we also, it, this has two other factors that are really important. And one of those is lifestyle preferences. So it allows you to have not just this, it allows you to quantify something that's subjective. So, you know, maybe you do need um, family time or other time one day a week or something. And so that's, you know, that may make one market, you know, less interesting to you. Um, and then there's always risk, you know, if it's a farmer's market and there's bad weather, um, you know, you're probably not going to have that same sales volume. And, you know, in COVID, it could be, you know, what if there are limits on the number of customers who can come and shop at that venue? And we certainly saw that in Colorado is that we just, you know, with social distancing and everything, there was a much lower throughput, for lack of a better word, of customers in farmer's markets, for example. And so that made it challenging to get that, that sales volume that our producers were used to. So we did market channel assessments over two years with 50 different producers in, through, throughout Colorado. And so these are all based on those on these labor logs. And so we had producers, this was not their favorite thing, but we had them um, collect by worker the time that those workers spent doing four different marketing functions. So harvesting, processing, and packing, um, travel to that point of sale, delivery, and then what we call sales and bookkeeping. And so that can involve, you know, being at a farmer's market or another point of sale, um, you know, being there to um, finalize a transaction with a, um, a restaurant buyer or something. And so we had them collect very specific 
um, information on how much labor was went through each of these different channels for each of those different functions. So it was for one week, you know, it was representative of what happened during the season. And we did, you know, 50 different producers did this. And we had, we actually had some producers who came back and they made some adjustments after the first year and said, okay, let's do this again. And let's see if we haven't kind of dialed in profitability in, in different channels. So we take those, you know, those labor logs, we start at harvest because, you know, you, you have to cut some stuff off somewhere, made the assumption that, you know, that the labor that happens up until harvest didn't really change um, what was going to happen when you went to market that product. So inputted, we did all the inputting of these labor logs and, you um, generated these reports. And so the reports produce some some different information. And so, you know, it definitely helped the producers identify how much labor went through each of those channels. And so you can see this on the next slide, I think as well. But like, if you look, you can see um, there in this circle, you know, you've got um, your labor across all employees broken down by, um, by market channel. So you can see the total there. And then you can also look at it by function. So where are you spending a lot of your labor along that continuum of getting that product, you know, harvested and to the point of sale. So it allowed us then to do some, um, some analytics for the producers. And, and I'll show you, there's a spreadsheet. So it's kind of automated. So you could do this yourself. Um, if you if you wanted to. So um, then we also had the farmers, you know, this was like observed and recorded data, but we said, okay, you know what, how risky is this particular market for you? So can, are you going to show up at this restaurant and the chef is going to reject the product or, you know, so is that the kind of risk? Um, is And is that stressful too? So, you know, we looked at these different interactive factors um, so this is just another uh, shot of that report. And so it gave the producer a lot of, of information. And it also helped them look at, you know, honestly, which employees, if they had, you know, a, a group of employees, which ones were working more efficiently, you know, maybe they were better at one marketing function than another. So it was better to get them, you know, out of processing and packing and just have them be at the point of sale. Um, so it did allow them to do some other types of, of analyses. So, and then we put all this together and we developed benchmarks that producers could measure themselves against. So they could see, you know, for the channel that they were using, was there, you know, where did they fall? And so, you know, we, we thought this would help producers see, you know, maybe they could make some changes and, you know, increase their, um, their profitability to some degree in that channel. Or make them feel like, yeah, there's a wide range of profitability and you're in there. Um, so this shows you then um, how those channel rankings come out. And so, you know, you can see volume rank, the highest volume here. This may be hard for you to read, but, you know, Farmers Market One has that highest volume. So they're ranked across the different market channels. So this particular producer had six different market channels. And so you rank by, um, by volume, by the labor hours that are required, um, the profit margin, financial risk. Um, and so here, you know, CSA was considered to be the, the most, you know, the lowest risk and then um, its lifestyle ranking. And so then um, if you just look at the straight average of all of those factors, you get this unweighted score. But we said, okay, you know, let's let's look at which one of these things is ultimately feels more important for your business. We want you to weight these. And so we had them weight volume, labor, and you can see in that factor weighting bar there at the bottom. And again, you know, this was all in a spreadsheet. So they just had to tell us okay, I feel like, you know, for my channels, profit is really important. I'm going to give equal weight to volume and labor. And then, you know, financial risk less is going to, going to be equivalent to lifestyle. 
And so you can see that's how this particular producer um, did that. And so what we got then, um, when we put these benchmarks together, and I've got a little set of these charts to share with you, is we came up with these um, marketing profit margins. So this is not the profit margin across the entire um, production and marketing operation. It's just looking at that marketing function. So just to be clear that, you know, that's what these intervals are looking at. So this looks at, you know, for our um, direct to consumer markets, our producers who are selling into direct to consumer markets, and I put a little blue arrow over that so you can see there's a really wide range of those marketing profit margins. And so, you know, remember that's going to be um, those gross sales minus the marketing labor. So we talked about how, you know, market the labor is a really key piece of this. And then those those travel costs, because those are also, um, you know, significant for a lot of these points of sale. Well, if you look over, CSA then has a really narrow set of um, marketing profit margins there. And so you can see, you know, the green bar shows us that lowest um, group. We've got our median there in the middle at orange, and then that 75th percentile, those are like our, our high flyers, our highest performers. Um, are there at, you know, at 80%, but that's a narrow interval. Farmer's market, you know, if you look over, you go over one more set of those percentiles and you can see there's quite a spread. And that makes sense, you know, because not every farmer's market is going to have the same return. And we saw that as we looked at that, um, you know, that little image I showed you on the prior slide. And then farm stand is kind of interesting too. You know, obviously, there were, um, you know, better returns for some of those uh, farm stand operations than others. So maybe, you know, some of them had way too much labor present. So that's direct to consumer markets. These are intermediated. And so you can see, you know, a little bit higher um, marketing profit margins, but again, you know, overall a, a narrow band and then distributors, you know, we saw up to 90% um, marketing profit margin as low as 67, 68%. But then, you know, grocery, we see a wider margin, restaurant even wider and a little lower. And then other was like farm to school, farm to institution. And so, you know, quite a variety, you know, quite a, a, an array across our producers. And so this shows you, you know, they're, they're managing labor differently. The returns to labor are, are different. And we'll take a look at that next. So this then, um, this is kind of like death by PowerPoint or something, but this shows you, you know, sales. This is your return um, for every labor hour that you spent, you know, every labor hour you invest, what are you, what are you making back in sales? And so here we've got, you know, these are our direct consumer producers there on um, the, the left with that blue arrow. And you can see there's a pretty wide spread there. The most narrow set of margins, CSA, um, farmer's market, lower certainly. And typically there's a lot more time invested in farmer's market to get those, you know, to get those sales and then farm stand. And that's kind of consistent with what we saw with the marketing profit margins. Okay, last, I think last one of these um, are looking at the intermediated markets. And so again, you know, if I'm, um, I'm spending an hour of labor here, I'm gonna get back a pretty wide array of returns for that hour of labor. And so, you know, from 74, our high performers, all the way down to, you know, $19. And so, and you can just see as you look across there from distributor to grocery to restaurant, to that, you know, farm to school, farm to institution, there's really quite an array. But what that allowed our producers to do was say, you know, okay, I see I'm just at about the median. Okay, I can, you know, make some adjustments to, um, you know, increase my returns perhaps. Or if you were down closer to that, you know, lower percentile, it gave you, you know, a stretch goal there. 
So, um, and then this is just the, the last of this set of, of graphs is looking at by those marketing functions. And so what I've got here are, are um, direct to consumer markets on the top. We've got top performers, bottom performers, intermediated markets, you know, top performers, bottom performers. And I think what's interesting is, you know, if you look at those orange bars for the top performers in, in both the direct to consumer and intermediate markets, the producers spent a lot more time harvesting the product than they did at the point of sale. And so they made that investment in, you know, getting good quality product out of the field, you know, cold chain and everything, and, and then getting it to the point of sale. But that's where the, the investment was. If you look at the, those bottom performers, and particularly in the direct-to-consumer market, you can see there was a lot more time invested at, you know, in that sales and bookkeeping category than there was anywhere else. And so, you know, by looking at this, when our producers got their individual reports back, they could kind of see where maybe they needed to make some adjustments to um, change their, their profitability. And then this just looks across those direct to consumer markets. So CSA, farmer's market and, um, and farm stand. And so you can see, you know, again, divided by top performer and bottom performer. And so again, it allows you to see there's a pretty big difference from where producers made um, their marketing investments. And it'll, you know, hopefully this allows them to become more efficient. So, um, you can access this tool. Um, again, you know, it's kind of a, a plug and play. You do have to collect the data. I think, you know, another use for this is um, using it to experiment a little bit. And so, you know, if you can look back on 2020 and say, you know, these were my rough um, this was a, you know, my my sales volume in these different channels that you could make some adjustments knowing, you know, you could just kind of say this is the labor I spent and you could do this same type of analysis, you could make some adjustments and say what would it take me um, in terms of like increasing sales volume or decreasing labor use to make this channel more profitable. So you can you can um, access that, and all of this information is on our website there at foodsystems.colostate.edu. Um, so I think you know as we we look ahead, I, some of the things that are are going to be different as we look to 2021 are how we use labor, and we certainly saw this in 2020 where it took a lot more labor hours. And so I think this is gonna change profitability of channels because you may need a lot more people at point of sale to you know, guarantee that transactions are, you know, there's maybe more distance between customers or customers feel comfortable, or maybe you're managing an online platform. Um, you know, so I think there's going to be, we're going to be seeing labor used differently in 2021. And so I think that's going to change, um, you know, the, the analysis of behind these, um, how you look at profitability in market channels. The other thing, you know, is, is, is I think we're going to see this continued emphasis on sanitation you know, hygiene and sanitation because customers are still expecting that. And I'm sure, you know, it's different from state to state, but there's still people who feel really vulnerable. And so, you know, I think we're still going to see this need to demonstrate that, you know, you're being considerate and you may well have public health regulations that require this too. I mean, we certainly still do. I, we are not anticipating that's in Colorado, you know, seeing that change anytime soon. Although we may be allowed to have more people at a point of sale, you know, still going to have social distancing requirements and, you know, the, the sanitation requirements that we'll have to meet at, at points of sale. And then the last thing is, you know, because we have this um, people are expecting to have um, contactless or much lower contact transactions, you know, having things bagged and ready to go, um, having things, you know, just more packaging that's going to facilitate that. So, it, you know, you have, um, you know, more bags or boxes or whatever that you're going to need to um, have for your different points of sale. 
So, you know, if you don't go down the market channel assessment route, you know, you can at least start sketching some of this out in a worksheet like this. You know, and just start thinking about, you know, as I as I look across my different market channels, you know, what is it going to cost me to be in that channel? And especially, you know, looking at 2021, um, what are, are some of those costs? How are they going to change? You know, I know what my income might be, and it might be a little bit compromised this coming year. You know, certain channels are definitely still uncertain. You know, those wholesale channels have taken a big hit. I, you know, we're going to start to see them come back, but we don't know certainly how quickly. Um, and then, you know, some of those other um, benefits. And so this is kind of similar to evaluating um, risk in a channel and lifestyle preference, but, you know, there are sometimes benefits that are important. They may not bring you um, a direct return, but maybe being there and, and, you know, having your business be showcased at that particular point of sale is really important. And so maybe, you know, that's an influencer of, of whether you stay in that channel or not. So I just thought I'd, you know, put that out there. If you don't want to go down a more like analytic route, you know, there are certainly, I think we're starting to get more information about consumer behavior and, and what our experiences were in 2020 to start to project um, what we might see in 2021. So, um, you know, again, I think this allows you to start thinking, you know, should I be in this channel? Should I start thinking about shifting? Because I can see my cost structure is gonna be really different in that channel still in 2021. So again, you know, it's kind of what we're, we're looking at here. And, and I think I'll, I'll pause and see if there are any questions like about those market channel assessments or any of that information that we just went through. So it's not like, you know, too much at once. Any questions there? I don't know if you guys, I think it, is it all in the chat? Yeah, okay. So I'll just take a, take a breather here and see if there's anything you guys were curious about. Hopefully you're eating dinner, it's that hour. Well, I have a question, Martha, sure. if I could, yeah. about, um, I guess I'm wondering if uh, in your research, if you felt like there was a lot of extra um, effort and labor involved this year in being contactless, in implementing um, these things that are safety concerns at this yeah. point. And I wondered how, if, you know, you feel how you can measure that, I guess, the extra investment in, in time and labor and yeah, no, it's a good question. And sometimes it is, you know, if you've got, for example, a CSA pickup. Um, and we saw this a lot throughout um, uh, throughout the state is, you know, you needed to maybe bring things to people's cars. And so you needed somebody to you know, like open the door or put the box in. You needed somebody there to tell people where to go, to tell them where to wait. You know, it was all of this, like, um, you know, channeling of activity and people to make sure that people were safe, they felt safe, you know, whatever that was, it took a lot more labor hours. And so I think, you know, in some cases, you could see at the point of sale, you know, you were probably doubling the presence of people you had to have there. Certainly at farmers markets, we saw that, you know, making sure that people knew, you know, they could only go, it was like a one-way market and they could, you could only have so many people. So you had people counting, you had people talking to customers and telling them, okay, you know, you have to wear a mask in this market. And I realize, you know, it's different in, and it was different to, in different parts of Colorado, but overall we did um, bi-weekly calls with our market managers trying to troubleshoot this, talking to our public health department at the state level, as well as local public health and trying to figure out how we could make this all fit together so that um, our different points of sale were still gonna be really profitable for producers 
given that they had all of these additional requirements to meet and a lot of them involved just having more like boots on the ground. So sometimes it's just as, as not simple, but you know, saying I'm gonna need twice as much labor at this particular point of sale. So maybe it's not a great channel for me for this year. So that's, you know, that's kind of what we saw. And that's the calculus, I think, that, that some of our growers are making, too, is just trying to figure out, or can, I, um, can my sales channel go more online? And is that a better way to reach people? So, and I don't know if any of your growers have moved more to online platforms, but even some of our growers who were kind of hesitant about it realized that it is a way that people are finding them, A, finding them, and B, feeling comfortable, like perusing products and, and buying. And they're actually making new customers that way. They're selling to um, folks they, that weren't in their customer portfolio before. So if it's not like the primary channel, it's another outlet for selling their products. So. Yes, we are have definitely seen, I think, um, people uh, going online, but um, in uh, joining those uh, distribution channels or the food hubs and things. Yeah. And I noticed that was one of the highest profit margin um, channels that you had mentioned. And so we saw a lot of growth yeah. in those folks who are out there getting vendors together so that you don't have to go online by yourself, yeah. build a website, build e-commerce, figure all that out, promote it, you know. So um, it's yeah. been kind of an exciting year for that. For sure, we had a couple of um, uh, food hubs in the area reach out to us and say, hey, we're looking for vendors. So it was kind of cool. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And we we definitely have seen that where our food hubs are, you know, they have all a whole new set of, you know, kind of like food box CSA type customers and they're coming, you know, the, the food hubs have a wide variety of products. It's multiple producers, you know, it really works well for everybody. And the, the food hubs have the infrastructure to be able to pick and pack more. So we definitely saw a lot of that during 2020 and they're totally expecting it to continue into 2021 because they're set up for it. You know, they've got these customers and they've been, you know, when we start to talk about promotion, I'll, I'll mention this, but, you know, they've been working with and, and keeping those same consumers engaged then throughout the year. And they, you know, they're still customers. So um, you know, there's, there's new avenues for sure. And I think, you know, that's the part that's, that's really exciting. Um, is that there are some new opportunities. It's just figuring out, you know, can you do that online sales platform by yourself? And, and there are open source platforms where, you know, that it makes it possible, but it's still, it's a lot of work. And so, you know, that, um, that bucket of like the sales and bookkeeping, that's going to be more, you know, that's going to require a lot more of your, your time, keeping the inventory, the pricing, um, you know, just managing all of those different aspects. So if there's a way to go in like with a food hub, or if there's a, another market that is um, putting together boxes for consumers, that's, that's really great too. Yes, yeah, I think everyone's kind of excited um, for this pricing <laughs> part of your conversation here. Um, and I do have some feedback here from Heidi. Hello, okay. Heidi. And uh, she says, uh, we have a CSA food hub in Vermilion, South Dakota. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, Heidi is hikes family farm okay. and uh, they uh, saw that once COVID hit the CSA went crazy sold out and uh, that they are doing curbside mm -hmm. and drive through where people drive up mm -hmm. tell us their name and we put their share in the vehicle and off they go we asked people to wear a mask we were all socially distanced 
and limited volunteers out at the farm. Yeah. So um, some, some really great ways that people have adapted and people really flourished in this environment and in um, you know, meeting that challenge and, and coming together like that too. That's great, that's, thanks Heidi. Yeah, that's awesome, Heidi. That's great, you know, you were able to, I see there's another comment here. I wish you guys could unmute. Let's see, and we nearly sold out. You have 14 shares left. And isn't that amazing? You know, people are, are so they're driving up to pick up their share. They're coming to your farm then to pick it up. That's awesome, yeah. So, you know, that's like kind of what I, one of the things that, that um, I thought I'd chat with you all about pricing is, you know, just the, having that like rationale for what your pricing is, because obviously, you know, it's gonna depend on the channel. And that's one thing that our producers found is that people really understand if you need, and you should be charging more if you're, you know, delivering, you've got a different kind of operation because you're customizing, you know, those are definitely where I think you have less of a conversation to have because it's understood your costs of operation are going to be a lot higher. Um, you know, when we're looking more at those, those wholesale buyers, that's where, you know, I think you really need to go in with your, um, your an understanding of why you're pricing your product um, as you are. And, you know, we, we look at pricing as there, you know, three different ways. And so, you know, with ways to adjust depending on market conditions. So, you know, that, that value-based pricing. And so, you know, that's what Heidi's got people driving, you know, I don't know how many miles they're driving to, to come and pick it up, but, you know, they're probably going to pay more because they are loyal to, you know, Heidi's CSA program. And it's really important for them. They know her, they know her, you know, her products and they feel those are, you know, it's really important. Um, but then, you know, in, in more of a, um, a different market setting, you know, your pricing may be based more on, you know, what other producers are selling so that, you know, what is the competition? Um, is everybody selling um, an array of eggs like this and they're all at, you know, um, $4 a dozen, whereas, you know, if you've got um, consumers who are coming to you and this array of different colored eggs is really important to them and they're willing to pay $6 a dozen. Um, and then there's, you know, setting your prices based on your costs of production. And so this is where, you know, having enterprise budgets or having, you know, keeping track of what it costs you to sell in those channels is really important. And that sets you up to have those discussions with customers. You know, this is where you get that, um, that pricing power as a, as a producer. Um, is when you can say, this is what it costs me to get this product from, you know, the farm from seed to, you know, this, this point of sale. And then, you know, using different strategies to um, tweak those prices, depending on what's going on. And so, you know, if, for example, you, um, I see a little comment here. Let me see. Um, okay, I'll, Let's see, we raised our CSA prices this year due to COVID and all the expenses that haven't resulted in COVID. Good, 57 minutes from you. We saw, also sold, this is Heidi, a commercial share to the hospital here in Vermilion and they feed the patients in the hospital. That's awesome. They bought a commercial share the past few years. So what is the pricing on your commercial share, Heidi? I'd be curious. You know, just relative to your, um, you know, direct to consumer share. If you wanted to to type that in, so again, you know there are strategies you can use to change prices depending on if you're trying to generate interest in a new product or you're trying to move some product that maybe you have a little bit of of surplus of. And so some of these strategies you see, like you know at um, fairs or um, shows and stuff for this like volume mu multiple item pricing, whereas I'm going to sell you eggs and bacon for, um, you know, 
like less than it would cost you to buy those individually, you know, that kind of product bundling pricing rather, or, and I might sell you two dozen eggs for less than I would sell you, um, you know, like the, the dozens individually. So I might sell you um, a dozen for $4, two dozen for $7 or something like that. And so depending on what you have to move, you know, you can use these other strategies to, um, you know, to, to work with your, your, um, your customers there. So um, a tool that we are looking at bringing to the West, um, this is also from Cornell. We, we um, pirate a lot of things from them. So for those of you who are meat producers, this um, meat suite, and you can go online and use this. This is another tool that you know really helps you think through you need to come in with your costs of production. There are some, you know, you could use some, um, you know, kind of given costs of production in there um, for like processing and marketing. You could use the given in that tool, but it would be really good if you, you know, had generated your own. But what you do is you identify what your profit per head, for example, is, and then you figure out, you know, what price you can get per cut um, in each channel. And so you can go through and if it's, um, you know, if it's pork or if it's beef, you can go through and use this tool for each channel to figure out, um, you know, how you can meet your um, profit goals for each of those channels. So we're in the process, we've applied for funding to, to bring that to the Western states and hopefully generate some cost of production data um, that'll help producers out here. But we think, you know, this is another tool to really look at how you can differentiate your pricing for each market channel. Um, the takeaway here is, you know, really knowing um, what you need to, um, you know, what you can ask for prices. And so I haven't read Heidi's comment there yet, but, you know, obviously those um, retail, other, and, and then those intermediated channels, sometimes you're going to have a lot less flexibility with price. And that's why it's good to come in knowing what you need to get. And, and being able to have that communication with the buyers. Um, I put this in, you know, about calculating retail prices because one of our um, farmers market association, so it's not our state one, but it's a, a county that manages five, they have five different markets and they actually went more to a wholesale model. That's what they're transitioning to to 2021. And the director for that association said, okay, I'm gonna price this according to, I'm gonna put in a margin that is gonna account for, and I'll show you some of the things that they were looking at, you know, things like um, demand availability there, you know, are we looking at, um, we don't have very much in stock. Is this gonna require me to get extra cooler space to hold it? And so he actually looked at what typical margins were and came up with a margin. He used, I think it was 30, I think it was 32% margin on top of cost to figure out what his prices were going to be through this online platform. It's been very, very successful. And it's a huge operation that they pick and pack, you know, hundreds and hundreds of boxes per week. Um, including boxes for consumers who um, are in a food access program. So um, I put here, you know, if you're looking for um, ideas of where to find prices, you know, that you can use as a reference. Um, I saw that North Dakota did some farmer's market price data collection for 2016 and 2017. Um, I did some from 2011 through 2018. I'm really hoping I can do this again this year. Um, 20, last year, it would have been just way too much of a stretch. But I think, you know, having some reference data so that our producers could see what they might ask in different farmers markets around the state um, gave them just some way to enter into those markets. Um, USDA has some data too, so you can find some retail pricing data there. They've got some newer price series that look at more differentiated meat and dairy products. So those are kind of interesting to look at. If Again, if you're looking for a place to, to start, as you're maybe building a budget, um, figuring out what your pricing might look like for this year, 
And then um, they all, there's also some data national, but you know, looks at some local and organic prices too. That might be useful for you to look at. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to talk just a little bit about promotion. Kathleen was, was interested in this. And so um, of all of the produce of the consumers who were looking at new market channels, you know, they, they ask, this is specific to farmer's markets. And I'll tell you why I pulled this out. They said, you know, why did you um, go to that particular farmer's market? You know, what drew your attention there? There were 170 different responses, but when they bundled those together, you know, they came up with, um, you know, these ads, so online primarily, um, friends and family, which, you know, a lot of times we see that being, you know, like recommendations, people see it on Facebook or other social media platforms. We saw social media in general, so various platforms at 17% internet website, um, and then, you know, drove by, walked by, and saw it kind of thing. Those were all bundled together, and then word of mouth. So, you know, the, the takeaway for these um, farmers market channels, and again, this is from across the country, is there's a lot of visual promotion going on here. Um, and so one thing that we did that I thought you might be interested in is we applied for um, a specialty crop block grant through our Farmers Market Association. So, you know, the association is pretty small, doesn't have a budget for marketing. Our markets tend to be small, don't have budgets at all for marketing. A lot of, um, you know, part-time or volunteer market managers. And so our Farmers Market Association said, what if, we get some funding to hire someone who can generate posts that can then be reposted. And so that's what we have been doing. And it's been really successful. Um, it gave our, you know, week by week or, you know, every couple of days, it gave our market managers some content and really beautiful content. Um, you know, we did an Instagram story takeover for one period of time. So that was, you know, over three months. So that allowed our association to um, highlight specific, you know, markets could highlight themselves, what's unique about them and everything, anything they wanted consumers to know. So I'm, I'm putting this out here because I think it's, you know, it's a pretty low cost way if you can get that initial person to strategize about generating the content, it makes it easier for other people to piggyback on. And especially, you know, we've, our markets are all over. We've got a lot of rural markets and they just, this gave them content that they could use. A lot of Facebook pay, posts, um, and so they pertain to different things. You know, some of it was keeping customers interested all year round, you know, with winter markets or online markets. Some of it was getting people interested in trying new things, trying recipes and, you know, using a crop or a product they hadn't used before, or it might be, you know, eating well, eating better. And so we did do, you know, we had some paid ads, but a lot of it was just organic um, reposting and it was it's really been very very successful as a, a low cost way to um, en enable our per, you know both the market managers as well as producers to get some content um, that they could then use um, on their own. Uh, we did some newsletters and these are all you know digital newsletters again because you know co covid means people don't want a lot of paper and people don't want a lot of paper anyway and so this was um, one way to get around that was doing a lot of um, of digital communication um, the the traditional media sources really didn't have the return and that we could you know, you can quantify reposting and sharing and everything easier than you can like kind of calculate impressions with traditional ad, but we did, you know, our Farmers Market Association did try that too as a way to try to um, reach more folks, but not a big investment at all. And then the last thing that you guys may um, be involved in, there, there are two that are, are used a lot by our growers. And one of those is this United States meat and produce market. 
And um, I found this post the other day, you know, I'm so glad I found this site. I buy straight from the company. So that's the producer. And we're on a first name basis now. Never go back to the store bought meat. And so, you know, that's a national site. But I see a lot of our producers posting there, um, as well as we've got this Shop Colorado Farms uh, Facebook page, too. And so, you know, this post I saw just the other day, you know, what is the best, this person's asking the question, what is the best way to support the family-owned farms? So there's this whole, you know, interest in value. Um, there's, you know, this value-driven interest in products of connecting with farmers, knowing that, you know, when the grocery store shelves were empty, our producers had food. So, you know, this person says, forgive my lack of knowledge on this because I have been a grocery store shopper since I moved here in the Midwest. We had farmers markets in the summer and fall, and I would love to, blah, blah, you know, stop relying on the grocery store for my produce, dairy, and meats. So I think, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of opportunity here. Um, these, these posts, you know, it doesn't cost anything to post to these Facebook pages. You just have to request to, to join the group. So, um, that was what I, you know, what I had for tonight. Tried to squeeze all that in one hour, and um, you know, just get you guys thinking about. Um, and I don't know if you have time to chat, but you know, what what are you thinking about doing differently in 2021? And you know, what kinds of things, both values as well as process, are you going to communicate to your consumers? So. I will stop there and leave you with this lovely broccoli tree and see if there are any, any comments. I know I went through that fast, but I wanted to touch on everything that Kathleen told me I needed to say, so. Kathleen, is there anything you can think of? No, we've got, uh, thank you hear from Cole in the chat. And uh, that was amazing that you uh, did just uh, deliver the goods on <laughs> all of the things that we had requested, all the kind of specialty things. And I really appreciate that. And, you know, that you would fit it all into one hour. I think it's, um, you know, it's a uh, lot to go through and to yeah. process. Um, but those specific tools that you gave for really finding out like where your time yeah. is best spent, spent. is yeah. going to be uh, something that people can refer back to throughout the year. So I hope so. And Kathleen, I'll um, send this PowerPoint to you so you can share because it does have links that, you know, I don't want people to try to scribble that stuff down. So um, that way you'll have the links and you can pass those out. Great. We'll be putting this in the newsletter, in our e-newsletter, and also uh, posting on YouTube. Um, okay. So, but then with the links in there, okay. that will be perfect. So uh, Heidi says, thank you. And uh, that people were getting concerned, yeah. people were concerned about getting food. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, really been a unique time that, yeah. that people have turned to buying fresh, buying local, and have this new and uh, renewed concern yeah. about where their food comes from and, and um, how valuable it, it truly yeah. is to know where that um, comes from. So it's... Uh, I think we need to capitalize on it. You know, we're at a moment where I think right. we can you know, really secure this new cohort of buyers and, and retain them. So we've got a lot of different ways to do that. Right. And I know our uh, members really appreciate the education that um, everyone has given that you've given us here tonight that will allow them to do that. So thank you very much for your expertise okay. and um if we don't have any questions i think we can just wrap up the meeting great well thank you martha for your time sure thing all right well good night everybody
Good night. Good night.